All this Jed knew well, and more. For ever since he came to Lord Horning, he had held in mind and pondered over all that he had ever learned of dragons. As he guided his small boat westward, not rowing now, nor using the seaman's skill Pechvary had taught him, but sailing wizardly with the mage wind in his sail, and a spell set on prow and keel to keep them true, he watched to see the dead isle rise on the rim of the sea. Speed he wanted, and therefore used the mage wind, for he feared what was behind him more than what was before him. But as the day passed, his impatience turned from fear to a kind of glad fierceness. At least he sought his danger of his own will, and the nearer he came to it, the more sure he was that, for this time at least, for this hour, perhaps before his death, he was free. The shadow dared not follow him into a dragon's jaws. The waves ran white-tipped on the gray sea, and gray clouds streamed overhead on the north wind. He went west with the quick mage wind in his sail and came in sight of the rocks of Pendor, the still streets of the town, and the gutted, falling towers. At the entrance of the harbor, a shallow crescent bay, he let the wind spell drop and stilled his little boat, so it lay rocking upon the waves. Then he summed the dragon, Usurper of Pendor, come defend your hoard. His voice fell short in the sound of breakers beating on the ashen shores. But dragons have keen ears. Presently, one flitted up from some roofless ruin of the town, like a vast black bat, thin-winged and spiny-backed, and circling into the north wind came flying towards Ged. His heart swelled at the sight of the creature that was a myth to his people, and he laughed and shouted, Go tell the old one to come, you windworm! For this was one of the young dragons, spawned there years ago by a she-dragon from the West Reach, who had set her clutch of great leathern eggs, as they say she-dragons will, in some sunny broken room of the tower, and had flown away again, leaving the old dragon of Pendor to watch the young, when they crawled like baneful lizards from the shell. The young dragon made no answer. He was not large of his kind, and maybe the length of a forty-oared ship and was worm-thin for all the reach of his black membranous wings. He had not got his growth yet, nor his voice, nor any dragon cunning. Straight at Ged, in the small rocking boat he came, opening his long-toothed jaws as he slid down arrowy from the air, so that all Ged had to do was bind his wings and limbs stiff with one sharp spell, and send him thus hurtling aside into the sea, like a stone falling, and the gray sea closed over him. Two dragons like the first drove up, rose up from the base of the highest tower, even as the first one they came driving straight at Ged, and even so, he caught both, hurled them down, and drowned them. And he had not yet lifted up his wizard's staff. Now after a little time, there came three against him from the island. One of these was much greater, and fire spewed, curling from its jaws. Two came flying at him, rattling their wings, but the big one came circling from behind, very swift, to burn him and his boat with its breath of fire. No binding spell would catch all three, because two came from north and one from south. In the instant that he saw this, Ged worked a spell of changing, and between one breath and the next, flew up from his boat in dragon form. Spreading broad wings and reaching talons out, he met the two head-on, withering them with fire and then turned to the third, who was larger than he, and armed also with fire. On the wind over the gray waves they doubled, snapped, swooped, lunged, till smoke roiled about them, red-lit by the glare of their fiery mouths. Ged flew suddenly upward, and the other pursued below him. In mid-flight, the dragon Ged raised wings, stopped, and swooped as the hawk stoops, talons outstretched downward, striking and bearing the other down by neck and flank. The black wings flurried, and black dragon blood dropped in thick drops into the sea. The Pendor dragon tore free, and flew low and lamely to the island, where it hid, crawling into some well or cavern in the ruined town. At once Jed took his form and placed down again on the boat, for it was most perilous to keep that dragon shape longer than need demanded. His hands were black with the scalding worm blood, and he was scorched about the head with fire. But this was no matter now. He waited only till he had his breath back, and then called, Six I have seen, five slain, nine are told of. Come out, worms! No creature moved, 
nor a voice spoke for a long while on the island, but only the waves beat loudly on the shore. Then Git was aware that the highest tower slowly changed in shape, bulging out on one side as if it grew an arm. He feared dragon magic, for old dragons are very powerful and godful in a sorcery like and unlike the sorcery of men. But a moment more, and he saw that this was no trick of the dragon, but of his own eyes. What he had taken for a part of the tower was the shoulder of the dragon of Pendor as he uncurled his bulk and lifted himself slowly up. When he was all afoot, his scaled head, spike-crowned and triple-tongued, rose higher than the broken tower's height, and his taloned forefeet rested on the rubble of the town below. His scales were gray black, catching the daylight like broken bone. Lean as a hound he was, and huge as a hill, yet stared in awe. There was no song or tale could prepare the mind for this sight. Almost he stared into the dragon's eyes and was caught, for one cannot look into a dragon's eyes. He glanced away from the oily green gaze that watched him and held up before him his staff that looked now like a splinter, like a twig. Eight sons I had, little wizard, said the great dry voice of the dragon. Five die, one dies. Enough! You will not win my horde by killing them. I do not want your horde. The yellow smoke hissed from the dragon's nostrils. That was his laughter. Would you not like to come ashore and look at it, little wizard? It is worth looking at. No, dragon. The kinship of dragons is with wind and fire, and they do not fight willingly over the sea. That had been Ged's advantage so far, and he kept it. But the strip of seawater between him and the great gray talons did not seem much of an advantage anymore. It was hard not to look into the green, watching eyes. You are a very young wizard, the dragon said. I did not know men came so young into their power. He spoke, as he did, in the old speech, for that is the tongue of dragons still. Although the use of the old speech binds men to truth, this is not so with dragons. It is their own language, and they can lie with it, twisting the true words into false ends, catching the unwary hearer in a maze of mirror words, each of which reflects the truth, and none of which leads anywhere. So Get had been warned often, and when the dragon spoke, he listened with an untrustful ear, all his doubts ready. But the words seemed plain and clear. Is it to ask my help that you have come here, little wizard? No, dragon. Yet I could help you. You will need help soon against that which hunts you in the dark. Get stood numb. What is it that hunts you? Name it to me. If I could name it, Get stopped himself. Yellow smoke curled above the dragon's long head from the nostrils that were two round pits of fire. If you could name it, you could master it, maybe, little wizard. Maybe I could tell you its name when I see it close by, and it will come close if you wait about my eye. It will come wherever you come. If you do not want it to come close, you must run and run and keep running from it, and yet it will follow you. Would you like to know its name? Get stood silent again. How the dragon knew of the shadow he had loosed, he could not guess, <clears throat> nor how it might know the shadow's name. The archmage had said that the shadow had no name, yet dragons have their own wisdom. They are an older race than men. Few men can guess what a dragon knows and how he knows it, and those few are the dragon lords. To get only one thing was sure, that though the dragon might well be speaking truth, though he might indeed be able to tell Ged the nature and name of the shadow thing, and so give him the power over it, even so, even if he spoke the truth, he did so wholly for his own ends. It is very seldom, the young man said at last, that dragons ask to do men favors. But it is very common, said the dragon, 
for cats to play with mice before they kill them. <laughs> but I did not come here to play, or to be played with. I came to strike a bargain with you, like a sword in sharpness, but five times the length of any sword, the point of the dragon's tail arched up scorpion-wise over his mailed back above the tower. Dryly he spoke, I strike no bargains, I take. What have you to offer that I cannot take from you when I like? Safety. Your safety. Swear that you will never fly eastward of Pendor, and I will swear to leave you unharmed. A grating sound came from the dragon's throat, like the noise of an avalanche far off, stones falling among mountains. Fire danced along his three-forked tongue. He raised himself up higher, looming over the runes. You offer me safety? You threaten me? With what? With your name, Yavod. <laughs> <laughs>